before we do that, can I just quickly, I may be joining uh, in from my laptop, from not from my phone. So I'm, I'm trying to put, put my laptop now. Okay, we are, we are live so, so that everybody knows oh. we are live now. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for uh, joining this uh, conversation. Uh, as you all know, um, <clears throat> uh, it's uh, the focus of uh, today's conversation is uh, uh, India, but more specifically, it's on Uttar Pradesh, a northeastern state of India. Um, Uttar Pradesh, uh, which is also known as UP, um, in in India. It is, uh, uh, it is a large state which if it, if it were to be a country, it will be the 10th lar largest country by land mass and sixth largest country by population. Uh, it, it contains three world heritage sites, including Taj Mahal. Uh, this is uh, Uttar Pradesh is, Uttar Pradesh is, uh, is uh, top the top uh, uh, state for tourism for all India, and it is the second largest economy uh, after Maharashtra. And uh, population wise, about seventy nine percent of uh, people who live in Uttar Pradesh are categorized as Hindus, and nineteen percent as Muslims, and rest of <coughs> just about. A uh, little less than two percent as uh, six Christians, Jain, and Buddhist, and some do not uh, identify with any religion. So that is the focus today, Uttar Pradesh. And since we don't, uh, we have uh, so many experts and luminary speakers here. So I am not going to get into their long bios, which are extensive, and everybody should know about it. But since in the interest of time, I will not get into their bios and you can Google them if you already don't know who they are and you can, <clears throat> you can learn more about them. Uh, with that, I will invite <coughs> Nikhil Mandala Parthi of Hindus for Human Rights. And uh, he has three minutes as everyone else. So please uh, make sure we don't extend the time because uh, we want to give the last person uh, equal time as well. So with that, uh, Nikhil, please go ahead. Sure, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. My name is Nikhil Mandalparthi and I'm the Advocacy Director with Hindus for Human Rights. And I'll be speaking very briefly on one main point, which I hope the following speakers will all be elaborating on that the declining democracy and human rights violations in Uttar Pradesh are having a ripple effect that is threatening India as a whole. As uh, Rashid just said, um, this is a state whose population is larger than most countries in the world. And so it's extra important that we're all paying attention to what's happening there. Now the international community has noted the steep decline in India's democracy over recent years. As many of you may be familiar, Freedom House downgraded India's rating from free to partly free in its 2021 report. And this trend of declining democracy is absolutely true for Uttar Pradesh as well. So the following speakers will be sharing the ways in which the Adityanath government has cracked down on protesters, journalists, and everyday citizens, even during the horrific COVID-19 crisis. I wanna focus on one specific example of how UP's increasingly authoritarian government is affecting India as a whole. And that's through the recently passed so-called Love Jihad laws. Nearly one in four Indians live under recently passed Love Jihad laws, which target young interfaith Hindu Muslim couples. The UP government justified this law as prohibiting so-called unlawful uh, religious conversions but in reality, these laws have led to mass arrests of young Muslim men and have empowered Hindu extremist groups to carry out attacks of, upon Muslims. A few states in India passed these laws earlier in 2018 and 2019, but it was really when Uttar Pradesh, this massive state, passed a love jihad law in November 2020 that set off a ripple effect across India. Inspired by UP's example, the neighboring state of Madhya Pradesh passed a similar law the following month. 
And as you can see soon afterwards, state governments across the country in the South in Karnataka, East Assam and West in Gujarat announced that they would be passing similar laws inspired by Uttar Pradesh. And actually as of just yesterday, June 15th, um, a love jihad law went into effect in the state of Gujarat in the West. Um, and this was directly inspired by the law that was passed in Uttar Pradesh. And so I want to just emphasize that this is just one way in which Uttar Pradesh's increasingly authoritarian government and the laws that it's passing are having a ripple effect that's threatening India's democracy and stability as a whole. So I want to just now conclude with a brief reminder of the stakes at hand um, from policy analyst Sushant Singh that if India has to be part of a global democratic counter to China, then the road chosen by Adityanath in Uttar Pradesh certainly doesn't lead there. Thank you. Next, uh, the next speaker we have is <clears throat> Uh, in the order of that uh, Jee gave me, the next speaker, there is a change, I believe, uh, is uh, Naila Mohammed from uh, USERF. Naila, you have actually seven minutes. Thank you, Hello, my name is Naila Mohammed. I'm a senior policy analyst for South Asia at USERF. I'd like to take a moment to briefly talk about USERF and what we do in promoting the universal right to freedom of religion or belief around the world. USERF was created by the 1990 International Religious Freedom Act, or IRFA. USERF uses international standards to monitor religious freedom violations globally and makes policy recommendations to the president the Secretary of State and Congress. USERF has a nine member bipartisan commission. Three commissioners are appointed by the president and six commissioners are appointed by the leadership of Congress by both political parties. USERF has a nonpartisan staff of about 20 individuals, including myself. I recently took on India under my portfolio at USERF but covered India extensively in my prior position as a journalist at Voice of America's Extremism Watch Desk and UP, for that sake, uh, a lot of coverage on UP. So under USERF's mandate, we issue an annual report which contains information on religious freedom conditions over the previous year and policy recommendations to the US government. The annual report covers countries that USERF recommends the State Department either designate as countries of particular concern or CPCs or include in its special watch list. Under IRPA, countries of particular concern are those countries whose governments engage in and tolerate systematic, ongoing, and egregious violations of religious freedom. Our 2021 annual report covers 26 countries which can be found on our website, www.userf.gov. All chapters in the report are approved by the majority vote and reflect the views of a bipartisan commission, of our bipartisan group of commissioners from different religious, political, professional backgrounds. Key findings, recommendations, and analysis for each country chapter represent insights and information gained through USERF's hearings, fact-finding trips, research, meetings with government officials, human rights advocates like yourselves, and religious leaders. Our concerns about India are many. USERF is concerned about religious freedom conditions in India, particularly in the state of Uttar Pradesh. This year, USERF recommended in its 2021 annual report that the State Department designate India as a CPC. Some of our key concerns that led to this recommendation include the CAA and the NRC. The Indian government has continued to target Muslims through the Discriminatory Citizenship Amendment Act. The CAA passage in December 2019 sparked widespread protests across the country in the early 2020, leading to over 20 people, mostly Muslim, killed in UP. In conjunction with the proposed NRC requiring all residents to provide documentation of citizenship or proof of citizenship, the CAA could subject Muslims in particular to statelessness, deportation, and prolonged detention. 
disinformation and hate speech. Disinformation and intolerant content about religious minorities, in particular Muslims, Christians, Dalits, have emboldened intimidation, fueled harassment, and created instances of mob violence. At the beginning of COVID-19, disinformation and hateful rhetoric, including from government officials, often disparged religious minorities and resulted in hate crimes. Additionally, false information aided with images sent via social media have implicated religious communities in alleged offenses rooted in policy, including, for example, cow slaughter, which is banned in UP, among many other states. The destruction of houses of worship, the verdict of the Babri Mosque, and the destruction of houses of worship, including the two recent cases in UP, are particularly alarming for USERF. Anti-conversion laws, another set of policies raising significant concerns for us. It often results in violence, in efforts to prohibit interfaith marriages or relationships using the false narrative of forced conversion. In the late 2020, um, Uttar Pradesh, India's most populous state, passed an ordinance of voiding any marriage conducted for the sole purpose of unlawful conversion or vice versa, quote unquote. Now, although similar laws were passed in 2020 in other states, UP law is particularly concerning, not just for its discriminatory purpose, but also because of its vague and overboard with potentially wide reaching impacts on religious freedoms in the state. Hindu nationalist groups also launched inflammatory campaigns decrying interfaith relationships or engagements, including calling for boycotts and censorship of media depictions of interfaith relationships. These efforts targeting and delegitimizing interfaith relationships have led to attacks and arrests of non-Hindus and violence towards any interfaith interaction. In a crackdown on civil society, USERF also raised concern regarding the closing of space for civil society through the FCRA and other laws. We know that this has had particular impact in UP where religious minority rights violations occur frequently and civil society lacks the freedom to document or raise their voice against it. USERF recommend that India is designated as a CPC for engaging and in tolerating systematic ongoing and egregious violations for religious freedom. Um, we suggest that impose targeted sanctions on individuals and entities responsible for severe violations of religious freedom uh, happen by freezing those individual entity assets or barring their entry into the United States. We recommend that uh, the Indian government advance human rights of all religious communities and promote religious freedom with dignity and interfaith dialogue through bilateral and multilateral forums and agreements. We have continuously condemned ongoing religious freedom violations and ask the Indian government to do so as well, to condemn ongoing religious freedom violations and support religious organizations and human rights groups by being targeted for advocacy. And we ask Congress specifically to continue to raise religious freedom, freedom concerns in US-India bilateral relations and highlight concerns through hearings, briefings, letters, congressional delegations. I look forward to discussing more with you today and learning about the situation on the ground in UP. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Naila, for that uh, brief but uh, very critical report from you, sir. Uh, our next uh, panelist is uh, uh, Hina Zuberi from Justice for All. She will give us a Muslim update. Um, thank you so much for having me here. I'm going to quickly talk a little bit first about just generally the background of UP Muslims, uh, unemployment and underrepresentation. The Muslim minority is the most deprived community in the Indian job ma market overall, but particularly in Uttar Pradesh from 2018 to 2019, there was a decrease, um, increase in unemployment by 9.9%. 5%, which is much higher than the national average of 7.23%. Um, this economic hardship further alienates the community from the rest of the population, makes it vulnerable to illiteracy, disease, crime, and various other socioeconomic problems. Studies conducted reveal that significant disparities exist in access to education for Muslims and other religious communities in Uttar Pradesh. Muslims have emerged as the worst 
uh, sufferers as far as their access to education is concerned. In the 2014 Lok Sabha election, not a single Muslim was elected um, amongst the 80 seats of parliament from Uttar Pradesh. Uh, the Bharti Janta Party won 73 out of 80 of these seats, and this UP election brought PM Narendra Modi to his authoritarian heights. The marginalization was repeated in 2017 with the upcoming election in 2021, Justice for All is concerned about escalating violence against the Muslim minority. BJP has used communism and anti-Muslim rhetoric in the past, and that rhetoric has led to attacks and deaths. As Nala mentioned, the Barabanki Masjid, uh, the illegal demolition of this 100-year-old mosque, uh, the Masjid Gharib Nawaz, al maruf a masjid that was being used by thousands of people um, and against high court orders, was demolished on May 31st. Um, justice for all fears um, that uh, attacks coordinated by RSS on the Shahi Idga in Mathura in um, using Krishna Bhumi, the same sort of rhetoric about the birthplace of Ram, uh, and here the birthplace of Krishna, a Hindu deity, and the Jahanara Mosque um, in Agra uh, between next year's state poll, uh, poll, um, polls and the 2021 national, 2024 national election. We feel that encouraged by the 2019 Babri Masjid uh, judgment, lawyers are regularly filing lawsuits, particularly in the state of UP, challenging the legality of mosques that have been standing for centuries. Um, a ground penetrating radar test application has been filed in the Mathura court, as well as in the Kashi um, and in the Kashi temple case. Uh, we, we are warning that these petitions will emerge as a central issue in Indian politics, and we feel will be used by the BAJP to attract the majority um, Hindu population and cause violence against Muslim community and their places of worship. Um, uh, looking at, uh, quickly looking over at the same thing has happened in the Musafar Nagar case, 62 people were killed in 2013, and the UP courts have let all 12 leaders of BJP who incited the uh, violence, they have been let go. There have been many recent attacks on imams, worshippers, ch Muslim children, um, cow lynchings, uh, and we could go on for for a while on this. So I'm hoping uh, my time is up. So I'm going to let it over to uh, the next panelist. Thank you. Thank you, Hina. I know it's uh, so much going on in UP. Still not much time, but uh, we will continue on this subject. Uh, our next uh, <clears throat> panelist is uh, John Prabhudas. He's from Federation of Indian American Christian Organization of North America. It is also known as FIACONA. John, over uh, to you. Uh, Thank you, Rashid. Uh, good morning, everyone, rather. Good afternoon for those in the East Coast. Um, <clears throat> I want to briefly mention uh, a, a couple of points and then point out uh, what is at stake for the US. Now, like Rashid had pointed out, if the Uttar Pradesh, the state of Uttar Pradesh, surrounding around the uh, Delhi area, uh, outside of Delhi, um, in the very northern parts of India. If it were a country, it would be the 10th largest. I think it used to be the fourth largest. Now, because they divided into uh, some smaller states have been divided. Um, it, either way, it's, it's a large area with a large population. So what happens there? It's like the, you know, comparatively speaking, I mean, for those who are not familiar with it, uh, it is like California in the US. It has larger, the largest contingents, uh, um, uh, members of parliament come from that particular state. So it matters. Um, what happens there matters. Now, during the pandemic, in the middle of the pandemic, the Modi government put in some restrictions on um, charity organizations in uh, in, in, in how they can receive funds from the over, from, from overseas donors. Uh, one of the things and people usually call it the FCRA, the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act of India, that put a lot of restrictions on Christian charity hospitals that are, that are operating in the US. I mean, generally it is, it is, it, it's, it's a, you know, it, is, it applies to all, all the country, all of the country, 
all over India, but it is particularly um, uh, became very uh, significant uh, restrictions on Christian institutions in UP because the Christian hospitals in Jansi and other places, Kanpur and other places, catered to this largest segment of population that we're talking about. And, and the COVID hit them hard. And we have seen this unfortunate, uh, very disturbing uh, visuals coming from UP where uh, uh, bodies were floating on the rivers and stuff. Now, the Christian charity organizations could not operate uh, because they could not have um, uh, not only the funds, but also uh, equipment and uh, oxygen tanks and other uh, uh, things they could not import from other countries. So eventually that was le uh, eased out and, and we were able to intervene um, and request the government to at least put some of these newly put in re regulations uh, to postpone um, those regulations uh, for a year, but they, they, they kind of gave, a, I think one month and a half, one month and a half uh, relief uh, for many organizations which, which helped a lot. Okay, now Christian organizations in UP under the Yogi Adityanath administration are choking, literally. Uh, they're, they're, they're finding it difficult to operate uh, across the state, um, more so um, uh, in, the, in the last uh, year or two, um, where Christian doctors are not allowed to um, uh, mention about even their uh, uh, their uh, uh, faith, uh, share their faith with uh, with the patients. Now, uh, that that whole thing is it's a different subject. We can talk about it, um, you know, later. But here are the other situations where where Christian pastors and 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 village uh, churches are being burnt and families are affected, um, beaten. And there are lawyers, and we are able to you know our, our partners on the ground are able to get some legal uh, help for them. But the lawyers are now afraid because the lawyers are being threatened. And many of these lawyers are Hindu lawyers. They are not even Christian lawyers. But they are afraid because they are not able to um, freely go and defend these victims because they are being targeted. They are uh, they are harassed, and, and some of them are in hiding. Some of the lawyers, and I, I got a report a couple of days ago saying that one of the lawyers is, is, is actually hiding from these mobs, which is very bad. Now, all these things are happening, and all the, there are a lot of other things are happening in different countries, but here is a question. Why should U.S. care about it? What is the U.S. interest in all this thing? Let's face it, America has not I mean, if you can finish time? it in a minute, would be great. Yeah. Okay. So we have not, America has not acted on any of these issues unless it is America's interest. It is in America's interest. Now, my argument is that if we do not intervene in the largest democracy that we call India, uh, at this stage, it will be too late <laughs> to intervene later. If you think that a breakup of, of, of Afghanistan or Pakistan or, or the hostilities from China is, uh, is a headache, wait until this happens with, with India. So it is in the U.S. national security interest of the long term that the U.S. should pay attention to it and do what is necessary to be done instead of being happy, or feeling happy about the government doing whatever that you want the U.S. wants, like a, like a refueling agreement or, or intelligence sharing, all these things are nothing compared to what is, what's in store for the U.S. So we better wise up and, and uh, do necessary things now to keep India on track and not side with, um, uh, with, the, with a kind of um, um, a political development in India uh, that is not good for Anybody, not 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 anyone in 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 Asian region, and not for us in the U.S. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. I agree. An un unstable India is not a good strategic partner for U.S. or any other country. Um, our next panelist is uh, Roja Singh. She's uh, 
She is from Dalit Solidarity Forum. Uh, she will give us a Dalit update. Uh, uh, Roja, you have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I just want to start off with a statement to say that today, however, one cannot strictly confine caste to religion for the inequity of the structure lends itself to provide spaces for the legitimized realization of political maneuverings using religion. And that is what BJP is doing under the ideology of Hindutva. And that is the basic problem that we're all here um, talking about what is the underlying monster here that, that we all need to hold hands in order to, to oppose, in order to find strength. So the total population in Uttar Pradesh is about 204 million. And of that 21% are Dalits. So my main source of information today are the organizations of the National Dalit Movement for Justice, National Campaign for Dalit Human Rights, who I've been working with for several years, um, are coalitions defending the rights of Dalits. So speaking of crimes against Dalits, particularly in UP, um, we know that there are pointed number of reported cases there, but however, those reported cases are an underestimation. There is a climate of hate that is rising rapidly in Uttar Pradesh as in other parts of India, but it's been because of the presence of the BJP government there and Dalits are being tortured for being empowered. So dominant castes seek it you know, as their responsibility almost to unleash violence on Dalits to wield power. So anti-Dalit violence, including rape of Dalit women, which is one of the highest rates of crimes committed against Dalits, is a manifestation of entitlement to power and ownership of Dalit bodies. So rape is no doubt a weapon of control. So while 2016 recorded over 40,000 cases, there were 43,203 cases registered in 2017. So this is just a one year increase there. An analysis showed a total of 62,195 cases of atrocities against Dalits remaining pending for investigation. So as John pointed out, there is no protection for anybody who's providing legal support for Dalit communities as well. So Dalit organizations are calling for immediate action as according to the National Crime Records Bureau of 2018, UP tops the list of number of crimes committed against Dalits, including Dalit women. And it's include, it has recorded a case of 526 rapes in the past year, an attempted rape of 48, and in many incidents of kidnap and abduct abduction of Dalit women over 380 cases in the past two years, and incidences of assault about 711 against Dalits alone. So therefore, political power structure, if you look at the political power structure, 23 cabinet, of the 23 cabinet ministers, not, not a single woman, and only three Dalits, and also the main ministries are being held by the dominant caste. So the list of 14 chief ministers of, U, uh, ministers of U, UP over the first 42 years of independent India is indicative of the power that the dominant caste have enjoyed, right? So five Brahmins, three Thakurs, two Vaishyas, and so on. So 42 out of 75 district chiefs and 11 out of 18 range chiefs, five out of eight zonal heads are all from the dominant caste. So therefore, there is this cry from the Allahabad High Court that over 90% of upper caste I mean, judges in the Allahabad High Court are upper caste, are dominant caste. So therefore we need to, for, for whatever reason, at least from the lens of a humane um, concern that we need to have as the United States, where we proclaim to be a land of liberty and justice, we cannot sit and watch these atrocities being perpetrated upon innocent people and especially due during COVID situation, we saw how the most affected were the Dalit communities dying on the streets. Most of them were Dalits and most of them went underreported or, or not reported at all in, because they are Dalits. So this kind of dismissal of Dalit bodies and taking control over Dalit communities because Hindutva believes that they have the power, they have the, um, the capacity right, uh, to do it. 
uh, in order to control and murder and, and perpetrate violence as a duty that they're carrying out against these bodies has to be called out because this is very parallel to what was done to, um, to the Jews um, in the Nazi period. So therefore we don't wanna sit and watch um, these kinds of atrocities happening. And so as the president of Dalit Solidarity Forum and member of India Civil Watch International, I condemn, we condemn these violences against Dalits just because in the caste system that is rooted in a caste ideology, Dalits are considered to be dirty and therefore punishable for any kind of progress that they make in society. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Roja, for that uh, <coughs> uh, that uh, very straightforward uh, information about Dalit. And I might add, this is not new. This is going on in India for hundreds of years. It's not beyond that. So you know, we all have uh, solidarity with uh, Dalit. So please include us in that. Uh, our next, uh, uh, the next up update is on free speech update. It's a five minutes update from a uh, author and journalist, Bhasha Singh. Bhasha, over to you. Thank you. I'm just trying to share the screen with my PPT. Is it visible? Is it visible? Okay. Yes, yes, we can see. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity. And right now when uh, we are talking, it's a really difficult time uh, to report, to share the news, uh, and especially from the ground. It's uh, entirely a diff uh, very uh, a different kind of fear is uh, in the air. And especially uh, because I belong to uh, Lucknow, uh, I have been brought up there and so many friends. So a different kind of environment has been uh, built up there. So uh, basically what uh, I feel that the freedom of expression and uh, uh, the media, the way it has to be uh, working, that is under the uh, threat here. Just let me know. Yeah. So uh, basically it's a test case for Indian democracy. Uh, Uttar Pradesh uh, is a very different kind of a state, the kind of leadership uh, under Yogi Adityanath. And uh, what I feel that it has become an ideal uh, laboratory for the Hindu Rashtra. Uh, whatever uh, the previous speakers have been saying, I think uh, if you coin like this, what a Hindu Rashtra means is beyond Gujarat model. Generally, we refer in politics, in media about the Gujarat model, but the model which is being executed in uh, 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 Uttar Pradesh, it's uh, a little uh, uh, more uh, beyond the Gujarat model. And uh, uh, the uh, RSS agenda is on the full flow. There is no equal space for the sections of uh, uh, like women, minority, Dalit. And when I say that uh, the previous speakers have spoken, and especially I want to uh, put here that the media uh, person who come from these backgrounds, as a woman, I feel as a minority, many of my friends, they have to, it's, it's very difficult to report uh, from the ground, to speak honestly, to uh, bring the truth and share the truth. And uh, there's a direct attack on all the dissenting uh, voices. That's a very uh, particular thing which is happening in Uttar Pradesh, that whatever you want to say, even you have ground, even if you want to do the minimum journalistic thing, it is very difficult uh, that uh, you can even report on the minimum uh, lacunas of the government policies, uh, even in the midday scheme, even uh, with the allocation during the corona, we have seen under this phase. And uh, in the first uh, wave also, we have seen that when the whole environment was cooked and designed uh, as an anti-Muslim thing, the whole tabliki element was uh, put into the fold, how the media was forced to go down to all these uh, forces. So, uh, and I think because the elections are there, so uh, it's a focal point now. You find that after the corona, there was a huge mess. Uh, a lot of reporting was also happening at that time. But all of a sudden, now the focus has turned again to the uh, whole uh, Hindu-Muslim uh, polarization. 
and uh, here come uh, to the point that attack on the dissent any form of the dissent or anything which is which runs uh, against the government uh, the simple example is the latest one uh, you must have uh, been hearing the news that how uh, just on sharing sharing a video which was viral on the social media many of our journalist friend had a word with the uh, victim who was assaulted uh, there's a different uh, versions uh, on this but now you find that there is a direct fir on all those uh, who shared but here also there is a discrimination the fir is only on the muslim uh, journalist or the activist if you go by the name many of uh, us also have shared many of other people have also shared and uh, retweeted it but when you go for the fir the fir on just tweeting just sharing that video uh, uh, has put and that, that, that's how the whole system is operating because there was a lot of uh, uh, thing which was happening and as you must be aware that one journalist uh, sulab shirwastav he was uh, with the national media channel uh, he was killed on uh, 12th june there was uh, and he complained that and uh, that's why i want to say that these journalists whom i'm just going to put the name few of them they were not doing anything beyond journalism they were just reporting as a journalist they were just doing their uh, minimum duty of bringing out a corruption against a leaker mafia against a political corruption against a corruption in the uh, argan bodies or the minimum local bodies but you find that the moment it is uh, in a prestigious constituency like uh, banaras from where uh, our prime minister is uh, elected so all the journalists who have been reporting be it uh, supriya sharma of uh, scroll be it uh, a very young journalist beneath uh, from jan sandesh times they were just reporting that uh, people are not getting enough food there is discrimination in uh, distribution they all are booked under severe cases they were immediately the fir's are uh, being uh, launched and so two ways uh, what we find that uh, recently in this may when this whole corona was there one of the journalist in siddharth nagar amin faruqi he was just reporting about a corruption case but you find that in the presence of the police and everyone he was beaten thrashed assaulted and then a fir against him only is filed and uh, uh, there are uh, many cases which uh, if uh, i have limited time so i just want to put on record this thing that be it uh, on 22nd uh, july a uh, vikram joshi a journalist he was killed in front of his uh, 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 two daughters because he wanted to protect uh, the niece who was being abused or he was being sexually targeted by some of the goons and nothing no follow up you will find that nothing is happening on the ground so uh, there is a different kind of a environment which is being cooked and uh, uh, especially the journalists uh, who come from the dalit background or uh, minority background there are two remarkable cases which i want to put here they show the kind of hostility against the media person one is the hathras thing the hathras incident you must be aware that it happened in uttar pradesh hathras where a dalit girl was brutally uh, assaulted gang rape uh, she uh, has recorded her statement everything happened i as a media person also tried to went there uh, go there report it was very difficult but finally i succeeded many of us succeeded but the moment siddiq kappan who is a journalist from kerala we all know about him he was on his way he has not even reached to hathras the whole story is being poked around uh, around hathras as a hathras conspiracy and finally till now he is arrested because he uh, is uh, uh, projected as he is a person who is associated with some organization and the organization also is not a banned one so that kind of environment is there and second journalist who is a very young expi- aspiring journalist prashant uh, kanojia he has been booked so many times just on a twitter because he was reporting uh, he was expressing his dissent uh, he was booked he was put in jail everything happened not much uh, hue and cry was there and finally he announced that he is leaving journalism he joined a political party so this kind of a uh, environment of fear 
uh, which is being uh, uh, promoted that shows that there is a very different kind of uh, environment which is being uh, uh, built in uh, uttar pradesh and uh, uh, i think the what uh, needs to be uh, shared with you that it is uh, not just the media person or not just uh, the people who are uh, reporting in a national media or a small media because when i am talking majority of the media you just go check if you see the yogi adityanath interviews his advertisement it's across same interview same ad so the no. media is along with them but even no. when there is being reported on the uh, deaths the dead bodies uh, flowing in the uh, ganges the environment is being uh, uh, changed they don't want to have a single report against them so that kind of possibility yeah but, sorry but we we have the next panel to invite yeah yeah so but i want to say that uh, on the ground what we find that they want to project that in a hindu rashtra like this there should be no dissent there should be no space for a woman for a dalit for a minority to express even uh, uh, or to do their uh, rightful duties so all those things are being curtailed there thank you thank you basha obviously without free speech uh, pretty much the democracy doesn't exist so thank you for that uh, that reporting and i know there is whole lot going on that you don't have enough time but as i said we will continue this conversation uh, as we uh, as we move forward uh, our next uh, panelist is uh, sandeep pande he is a social activist from lucknow which is the capital city of uh, uttar pradesh he will give us an overview of up in 5 minutes uh, sandeep sandeep bhai please thank you rashid bhai so uh, the yogi adityanath government in uttar pradesh has converted itself into a police state where every problem is viewed as a law and order problem and functions in a way in which uh, victims are made into accused bhasha gave an example and ordinary citizens are criminalized much before the widely reported oxygen shortage during covid pandemic recently dr kafil khan the nodal officer of encephalitis ward at brd medical college in gorakhpur was removed on 13th august 2017 for dereliction of duty khan's fault was that when on 10th august oxygen supply was cut off due to non payment of dues for which he was not responsible khan tried to make personal efforts to procure oxygen cylinders 70 citizens children died kafil khan spent 9 months in jail a departmental inquiry did not find him guilty he was arrested again on december 19 december 19 2019 for participating in anti citizenship amendment act meeting at aligarh muslim university and got bail on 10th february 2020 Uh, but was booked again under national security act on 13th february before he could be released he was finally acquitted by high court on 1st september 2020 and nsa was dropped against him the judges did not find anything wrong in his speech and instead they praised him in december 2019 large scale widespread protest took place against ca and nrc as was described earlier which were perceived to be discriminatory in nature especially against the muslim community 22 people all muslims and mostly due to police firing died during protests over 700 people were arrested on charges of destruction of property rioting and attempt to murder in what were mostly false cases which included large number of unknown people and notices were issued to accused for recovery of cost of damages 41 minors in western up were tortured by police in january 2020 related to quelling of anti ca and rc protests the government brought a recovery of damages to public and private property ordinance 2020 which was later made a law especially essentially criminalizing all dissent for example advocate mohammad shoaib president of socialist party india in up and sr darapuri a retired indian police services officer now a spokesperson of indian people's front were both detained in their houses on the day of protest 19 december 2019 even i was detained but uh, still they were arrested i didn't go to jail but my friends were sent to jail for about a month and slapped with notices for recovery 
In addition, their photographs along with other accused were displayed in holdings at prominent public places with their addresses to provoke public anger against them. Uh, fortunately, nothing happened. And all this was being done even before they have been convicted. They are just merely accused. Uh, between January 2018 and December 2020, the High Court quashed order of district magistrates from 32 districts in 94 out of 120 cases related to detentions under the National Security Act. The court held the DMs guilty of non-application of mind, denial of due process to the accused, repeated use of law to block bail. 41 of these cases related to cow slaughter, of which 30 were quashed. In communal incidents, all 20 cases were quashed, which means all of them were false. This demonstrates how law is being abused to fulfill the political agenda of right-wing Bharatiya Janata Party. Similarly, many people have been booked under UP control of Gunda's Act and UP Gangster and Anti-Social Activities Prevention Act and arrested on flimsy grounds. Uh, about Siddiq Kappan, Bhasha has already mentioned. I will just say that he got his charges against him for breach of peace have been dropped by a local court. But he has a sedition case and a case under Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, which is a very draconian law because in this law, you are uh, considered guilty until you are proven until you are proven innocent. And hence, the possibility of getting bail is, is uh, very dismal. Uh, even love has been criminalized in UP, as was said earlier. Uttar Pradesh prohibition of unlawful conversion of religion uh, ordinance was made into a law on 25th February 2021 which prohibits religious conversions by use of misrepresentation, force, under influence, coercion, allurement, fraudulent means, or marriage. This is in Hindutva parlance known as love jihad. Uh, the government of India has said that there's nothing like that in law and has been used only to target marriages between Muslim man and Hindu woman. According to National Family Health Survey, there are only 2.5% interreligious marriages in India and only 4.5% Muslim men marry women belonging to other faiths. In an investigation launched by UP police in Kanpur, among the 22 police stations in all of Kanpur, just 14 cases were found. Upon investigation in eight of these, women clearly stated that they had entered their relationship on their own free will. This is a good evidence that propaganda of love jihad, which is essentially Muslim men enticing Hindu women with a view to convert them to Islam, so that eventually Muslims outnumber Hindus, does not hold much water. Neither are mass conversions such a frequent uh, or large-scale events that, that they are of any consequence. So what was the need of the law? The obsession with law and order did not end in lockdown period either. In Bangar Mau Unnao, which is a neighboring district to Lucknow, 18 years old vegetable vendor Fazal Hussain was picked up by police on 21st May 2021 for apparently violating the lockdown restrictions and beaten to death inside the police station when the local population blocked the main road in front of the government hospital where he was where he was brought dead first information report was registered against three policemen of which two have been arrested the government has promised 4 lakh rupees compensation and job to a member of family but this is yet to realize a special security force has been created in uttar pradesh by law which will have the power to arrest any person without a warrant against whom there is a reasonable suspicion or who attempts to commit a cognizable offense. No court will take cognizance of offense against any member of the force without prior sanction from the Uttar Pradesh government. UP is on the way to becoming more of a police state. Since Yogi Adityanath has become the chief minister of Uttar Pradesh, about six and a half thousand encounters have taken place in which about 125 alleged criminals have died. So encounters are, uh, you know, face-to-face uh, -face criminals and police, and, and most of them are stage managed in India. And most of these targeted belong to other backward classes, Dalits and minority communities. The CM has been issuing death threats publicly, saying that criminals will be knocked off. And death procession of people indulging in love jihad will be taken out. He said, unki ram, na ram naam satya ki yatra nikli. So, uh, Sandeep, bhai, Sandeep bhai, yeah. another minute or so, then we need in to half, next. In half a minute, I'm finishing. So, uh, essentially, uh, you know, this is a CM and, and nobody tells him that he can't issue death threats like this. Uh, he, he subverts criminal justice system 
short circuits the judicial process and and believes in giving punishment even without trials on the other hand upper uh, upper upper caste criminals and vigilante groups who indulge in violence against the marginalized sections of population are hardly ever punished example from from uh, the muzaffarnagar where all bjp leaders have been acquitted uh in an attempt to become a strong state by enforcing law and order strictly the up government has created a situation of lawlessness where the police have become unaccountable the former mahoba superintendent of police ml patidar is absconding with a reward of 1 lakh on his head he is accused in an abetment to suicide case of a mining businessman just last year thank you so much thank you sandeep bhai i know there is lot to cover and uh, and as i said we will continue this conversation whenever we can come back to it but thank you for that uh, now we have uh, a obviously all these falls into so far the panelists what they discussed falls into human rights fundamental human rights so govind acharya of amnesty international usa will give us a human rights perspective you have 5 minutes uh, govind thank you rashid uh Thank you. My name is Govinda Charya. I'm the India Country Specialist for Amnesty International USA. And and as Rashid and everyone has said, there's so much to discuss. So I'm going to just talk just a little bit about a few cases that I think are indicative of a larger trend in 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 India's most populous state. And I want us to travel back to December 2019. And I think all of us, uh, most of the world, was. blissfully unaware that there was a impending devastating pandemic about to about to uh devastate the world and at that time all across india there were just very inspiring large widespread spread protests against a bigoted law called the citizenship amendment act and associated with that the national register of citizens and i want to talk about that what what happened in the uttar pradesh context specifically because the pandemic has actually caused many of us to actually forget a um, memory hole as it were the brutal crackdown against protesters and dissenters um that happened in the in the months that followed that or in the days that followed that frankly um and uh, most of the early attention i think was focused very much on the protesters in shaheen bagh in delhi and i think rightfully so that's where a lot of the media was but there was just protests all around the country and there were uh, quite impressive sustained protests in uttar pradesh but there was also brutal violence against protesters and frankly bystanders to to the protests and so i i'm not going to talk too much about i'm not going to talk anything about the laws that or to pradesh or the indian government can use to crack down on dissenters using existing indian law such as sedition or the uapa but i want to just talk about those specific events one i want to talk about which was um what happened at aligarh muslim university which is one of india's most preeminent universities uh, and this happened on december 15th and the aftermath and at amu protesters had gathered at the baba sayed gate and prior to this prior to december 15th there were widespread protests on campus but they were uh peaceful and the police hadn't intervened but not here clashes between police and protesters lasted for almost 2 hours and then the real brutality started afterwards in the night of december 15th and i think it's best reflected in uh one of the victims and survivors of of this brutality uh, tazim Tazim Khan he is a 20 year old he was a 20 year old undergraduate he was among those who ran inside of a guest house he says he hid inside of a toilet uh with eight other people and kept trying to reach out to friends he was later admitted to Jawaharlal Lal Nehru Medical College and Hospital with multiple fractures in both hands and Khan says he describes it as we could hear police going from room to room dragging out people we were inside for around 2 hours when police broke open the toilet door dragged us out and thrashed the nine people there hurling communal abuses shouting quote beat them up there is no camera here 
I was taken from one police station to another without in any medical aid. And he says he was even denied water. And later he was, like I said, admitted to hospital. But Khan was actually lucky in that he was even admitted to hospital. According to our own investigation and Amnesty's own investigation, and also by many journalists, doctors at AMU stated that on, on December 16th, 2019, police had actually blocked ambulances from entering the university to treat and in the injured students and take them to hospital. The Allahabad High Court on February 24, 2020, had criticized the Uttar Pradesh police violence against protesters and arrests of peaceful activists. But the UP police said that the use of force was minimal. And so if it was so minimal, I'd like to tell that to Mohammed Nassim of Varanasi, who was arrested by the police in the middle of the night in, uh, it could be December 16th, uh, 2019. His uncle, Mohammed Tufail spoke to Amnesty International and said, quote, the police broke into his room and took him away. They broke down a door that fell on his sleeping father. When we asked the police for the grounds of arrest, they did not say anything and dragged Nassim away. The police hit him with lathis, which to those who may not know, that's kind of a baton, a really awful baton um, that's widely used by Indian police on the way to police station. When we met him in jail, he told us that he was tortured at the police station as well, and we saw him in pain. And so the crackdown on, at AMU and also in other parts of Uttar Pradesh was, is one way to violate human rights using police brutality during the CAA protests. A second one uh, that, that Sandeepa just mentioned is by burdening people with, uh, with recovering the cost of damages to public property is, is how it's kind of phrased. It's, it, it's akin in the US, they, they use it to seize. They also have a thing that they use to seize, which is by, widely criticized as well, where they seize private property without recourse to the courts. And so in December 2019, after violence broke out in Uttar Pradesh, the state government sent notices seeking to recover 4.5 crore, which is rupees, which is about 650,000 US dollars thereabouts worth of damage to public property. These notices, again, were sent without any form of judicial scrutiny. And it raises the concern, frankly, of arbitrariness and bias. So furthermore, to require assembly organizers to shoulder costs for cleanup after public assembly is is definitely inconsistent with Article 21 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which India is a signatory to. So just to be clear that there, it's actually would be a violation of India's own law to be um, doing this. And such costs though also deter those wishing to enjoy the right to protest and freedom of assembly. And so I'll just wrap up uh, by saying that these efforts to curtail free speech and to use police brutality so freely in India's most populous state has the potential to be a, a model and a model in a very bad way for others, other parts of India to use to illustrate how to violate human rights with impunity that's in violation of Indian law and international law. And so um, it, we need to make sure that we do everything we can to help uh, stop all of these human rights abuses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Govind. Uh, in last 60 minutes, we have learned, uh, I would say a fraction of what all our panelists could have shared with us, uh, but we will continue this conversation. Before we end this conversation, I would like to thank uh, Amnesty International USA, Dalit Solidarity Forum, Federation of Indian American Christians of North America, Indian American Muslim Council, Hindus for Human Rights, Justice for All, International Christian Concern, and India Civil Watch. International for all their contribution. It took a lot, a lot to prepare for it. Uh, by the time we started this conversation. And I particularly thank Ajit Sahi for putting all this together. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us.